So I am going to talk a little bit about immunoprofiling as a tool for understanding what's going on in Norse. Um, my lab studies more broadly just children who have drug refractory seizure disorders for which we suspect there may be an inflammatory component. Um, I will out of the gate indicate that my hypotheses and model systems for all this are that these are an inflammatory and auto-inflammatory uh, disorder, not an autoimmune disease per se. Uh, what I'm going to talk about a little here is the idea of catching more understanding about mechanisms of pathogenesis based on uh, ex vivo profiling, in addition to or beyond just doing static measurements on biofluids. So uh, many of us are familiar, I presented this recently at AES. Um, we can pick up inflammatory cytokines, um, all sorts of different ones, in serum and CSF uh, from children who have these disorders. We pick up uh, high levels in some children of TNF-alpha and others have IL-6, others have IL-1-beta. We see CXCL-8 and these molecules that are consistent with a, 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 a clear inflammatory disorder. But as you can see from all of the yellow dots that are sitting down within the reference ranges and beneath the, the means, we, there's a lot of these kids who don't have this inflammatory profile. And so what does that mean? Does that mean that inflammation is irrelevant? in those patients? Or does it mean that our analysis of biofluids is limited by variables that we simply can't control? Uh, the static nature of the draws, the time that we caught the draws, when the, when the physician you know, decides to get the sample and have it sent out for analysis versus when the disease may have actually started the big pathogenic drive. These are obviously important things we have to continue doing in all of these patients. We need to continue measuring these biofluids and looking at these inflammatory markers. But what I propose is that there's an additional thing that we need to be doing. And so my lab has set up this uh, biospecimen process flow in which with outside collaborators, as well as here in-house at Mayo, um, we collect blood. We have that blood sent to us overnight, both some EDTA whole blood that is shipped at ambient and some that is frozen as well as frozen serum. And when that arrives in my lab, we then figure out based upon the volumes we get, depending on the age of the child, uh, a number of different analyses. Some of them are as simple as just getting DNA and RNA to be, uh, to be storing and looked at, as well as the serum and plasma. But more importantly is when it's possible, we are taking some of these, uh, this blood and preparing PBMCs and neutrophils. We're biobanking some of those PBMCs. Um, but we are importantly trying to use these cells to do ex vivo stimulation with different inflammatory drivers and then doing sort of proteomic transcriptomic analyses. Nothing yet is as um, sophisticated as uh, Dr. Hafler was showing, but our overall goal here is to take a patient's cells, look at their immunophenotype uh, at the time of the draw, and then also look at their PBMC and neutrophil responses when they're stimulated. And so for these experiments, we need to have controls and adult controls are not particularly good. Um, I have shown, I, when I spoke at AES, I showed, uh, some of you may have seen this idea of an age related change in the immunophenotype and the inflammatory uh, markers that are even present in blood. So what we do is we've established a study where we recruit children who are gonna get their well child vaccines at six months, one year, and about four to six years of age. We're also now recruiting children that are older than that because some of our subjects are in their teens. Uh, so we're now getting kids that come in when they get their influenza shots. We take these children, we take blood before they have their vaccine, and then we have them come back a week to two weeks later after the vaccine, and we do um, our panel of analyses that I highlighted in that flow chart. This is an example of a five-year-old boy who came and got his normal uh, package of, of vaccines at his five-year well child visit. We looked at his cells before vaccine and after vaccine, and there are some small changes. There's an increase in the number of monocytes, increase in the number of lymphocytes, as one expects. We have a standard immunophenotyping profile in which we look at neutrophils and monocytes. When we take the child's monocytes, what we can see is this pattern using CD14 and CD16 phenotyping, uh, a grouping of cells that we call classical monocytes, non-classical monocytes, and what my lab refers to as inflammatory and others refer to as intermediate monocytes. And you can see that in this healthy child, after the vaccine, uh, he evolved more non-classical, which are regulatory monocytes, as well as some inflammatory monocytes. This pattern is consistent with the idea of a normal change in the child that's induced by the response to the vaccines. Building up this repertoire, we currently have 40 kids for which we've done these kind of analyses, allows us then to understand what we consider to be a healthy sort of response. We also, sorry, things seem to be stuck. We also then looked at these same kind of phenotypes in kids that have seizure disorders. And I'm just showing you three examples. And what you can see here is that this is a 13 year old girl with a profound seizure disorder. She has a massive population of inflammatory monocytes in the blood that we drew at this point in time. 
Uh, this is a three-year-old boy. His monocytes look pretty normal, but he was missing almost completely his neutrophil population. And we have some hypotheses about why that might be. And then this is another 13-year-old boy. And you can see that while he does have this uh, classical pattern, it's actually aberrantly expressing CD14, and it's got a shift in its phenotype, which is suggestive possibly of some kind of defect in, in these cells. So that's one strategy is the immunophenotyping. But then, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're really interested in this ex vivo profiling. So again, we need to do this in healthies. And so these are five-year-old uh, five girl and a five-year-old boy. This is their pre-vaccine. We stimulated their peripheral blood mononuclear cells in this example, but we also do their neutrophils with what we consider to be a package of pathogen-like stimuli. So we use LPS, uh, we use poly-IC, which is a uh, virus uh, mimic, and we use heat-killed uh, Staph aureus or HICSA. And then we also include HMGB1 because my lab has become very interested based upon particularly what Ana Maria had told you as well about HMGB1 as an alarmin, a danger signal that the host picks up. That can be an auto-inflammatory, means it's released by uh, your own cells, and it can be generated by the presence of bacterial pathogens and other pathogens. So treating cells with this, uh, what we found was, again, the sort of normal response uh, in which the kids have um, a stimulated release of TNF-alpha, interleukin-1-alpha, IL-6, IL-1-beta, CXCL-8, in response to these different stimuli. Uh, the kids will respond to LPS or respond to this heat kill staph aureus. Some of the children have small responses to HMGB1. We use ATP because that is added to drive inflammasome processing so that we can get release of molecules like IL-1-beta. Again, Data here is less important than the idea that we have generating, sorry, this normal pattern. And then most importantly, we're now doing this in these kids who have these seizure disorders. What I'm gonna show you in this, in this example of data is really focusing on one child uh, who we've been studying for a, a little while in which we compared her mom and her dad's cells and her cells collected at the same time and then shipped up to us overnight um, from, their, from their home location. We've previously profiled this child by, and her parents, and her extended family, siblings and, and grandparents, by whole genome sequencing. And what we had found was that there was um, a particular heterozygous mutation in the child and the father that was in a molecule that alters toll-like receptor adaptation, so adapter molecules for toll-like four signaling. Um, and then the mother and the child shared a mutation in a calcium channel, which is not one that's normally figured as being a primary epilepsy driver. And obviously, the mother doesn't have epilepsy. But what we built up from this picture is the idea that the child had a predisposing electrophysiologically dysregulating mutation. And she also had simultaneously a uh, uh, mutation that led to a hypo inflammatory response to pathogens with a concomitant hyper inflammatory state that's generated in her body. I've got an excessive amount of data in support of this that has not yet been published. All I'm going to tell you right now about this condition is again, the idea that these are heterozygous mutations that there was one that came from the father to that had to do with uh, response to bacteria and one that came from the mother that had to do with electrophysiological dysregulation. I will also point out as a side note that when we determined that this calcium channel mutation, the child began therapy with um, a calcium channel modulator and that improved her seizure phenotype. But every time she had an, an active infection or inflammatory state, her seizures worsened. And we are now in the process of figuring out a directed drug therapy for this child tailored to the defect that we're seeing in her response to pathogens. Regardless, when we look at the kid at this child and we look at her parents with regard to this immunophenotype, what we noted is that the child has an increase in um, inflammatory monocytes. Her dad, again, I'm not gonna get into too much detail. He also has a shift in this population, which is consistent with his own uh, response to, path to pathogens, again, pointing out that he obviously doesn't have an over um, uh, disease phenotype. We took those cells and then we did the PBMC stimulations. And what we found across all of these, these data was that the child had <laughs> an inability to respond to HMGB1. I think somebody probably just gave me my time limit. I'll rush um, through HMGB1 and as well to some bacterial pathogens. We've now converted the cell, cell child and the parents to iPSCs, and we're generating neural cells and immune cells from these induced pluripotent stem cells, and we're attempting to work out the mechanisms of action here. What I'm going to end with on this talk is just a little bit of speculation. Uh, I've spoken with some of you in the past about this idea, but to me, it's been shocking, surprising, the number of these children who develop these acute onset um, seizure disorders that have recurrent or chronic middle ear infections or potentially other systemic bacterial infections. I'm gonna show you this MRI. This is the index patient that Eric Payne and I uh, worked on in Eric's uh, very seminal paper looking at the role of Anakinra 
in preventing seizures in this child. And what you will note is that this child at the time that she was in the, in the hospital being treated had a very severe uh, middle ear infection. I've looked at other kids that we've had come in and almost all of them have reported uh, having chronic middle ear infections uh, and these sorts of problems. I've therefore hypothesized that these kids have an innate immune deficiency that compromises their ability to respond to these environmental pathogens that as a consequence of the initial inability to respond to these pathogens, they have a hyperinflammatory response profile uh, that's driven in their monocytes and neutrophils. And so it is an early hypo response and then an inability to deal with the pathogenic burden over time that leads to this hyperinflammatory condition. So my hypothesis about Norse is that it's driven by an underlying and potentially cryptic pathogen burden that is combined with a dysfunctional innate immune response and all of this is within the context of a genetic predisposition to electrophysiological destabilization, again, which on its own may not be primary or overt. So it's a combination of an environmental uh, insult and a two-hit genetic susceptibility. Um, I just wanted to finish with a brief note again about the study that I'm running in my lab, which I would be more than happy to start collaborating with others. Uh, we call it RISC, Refractory Inflammatory Seizures in Kids. We have IRB set up to be collecting blood and all of these materials from children that are anywhere. Uh, in the United States and Canada and, and other places. And we have a very well-working machine for getting these bloods delivered to us overnight uh, and doing these ex vivo profilings. Um, and that's what I'm gonna leave you with on the blitz. It was fast, but hopefully it leads to some discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much. You know, uh, it's almost impossible to put all your work into seven to 10 minutes, but uh, <clears throat> that was that was great. Um, so. Uh, we don't have time for questions, but you can answer a couple. There's a couple in the chat. You can answer them in there. Uh, we're going to move on to the next blitz. The next speaker is Suki Ko. She's the chief of neurology at Children's Hospital in the University of Nebraska, where she just arrived this week. She was at Emory before that. Uh, she's a professor in pediatrics, and she is recipient of a seed grant given by Norse and the American Epilepsy Society. Uh, and she's a member of the medical advisory board of the Norse Institute. Dr. Ko. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am honored to participate in this very first and perhaps more to come virtual neuroscientific symposium. And I'll present uh, my very preliminary idea uh, working towards a novel marine models of fires and norse. And I don't think I need to convince this audience the importance of uh, animal model for ultra rare conditions such as fires and norse. Um, uh, but let me uh, try to justify uh, and uh, my ideas about the uh, adequate clinically relevant uh, animal model for fires and norse. As you are all aware, um, fires, uh, uh, different from Norse, where it's a subgroup where there is a preceding febrile illness, which then lead to acute epileptic phase of supra, super refractive status epilepticus. And what I like to point out is that really there is no break between initial uh, status epilepticus and, and, and lack of what we used to call latent period. So the children and uh, young adult will have experienced this very difficult to control uh, status epilepticus, which then uh, uh, lead to the development of spontaneous recurrent seizures, often drug resistant, and along with it, the um, neuronal degeneration and progressive cerebral atrophy. And you will, in that state, many, many of the uh, individuals will develop neurocognitive deficit. And so this lack of um, latent period is what made me think about what could be the uh, good animal model. Um, this is one of the many examples of direct evidence that showed uh, from biopsy of a patient with fires um, where this, there is a, a prominent uh, presence of CD8 positive T lymphocytes and HLA-DR positive activated microglia, really providing direct evidence there is no information involved in fires. And Dr. Anna Maria Vazani have amply uh, shown you that many other evidence, both preclinical and clinical. So 
this was the idea I had that this is a rapidly progressive onset of seizures and encephalopathy that evolve into prolonged super refractive status over a few days and then drug resistant epilepsy uh, without a latent period. And this is to be distinguished from the fever sensitive epilepsy. And um, what I have named the nuance that prolonged status epileptic NORPS model, which is intrahippocampicane uh, as an animal model of NORPS. And as you could see in these animal after uh, the mice have been injected into the hippocampus, a small dose of canate, they develop super refractory status and then they evolve within a week um, uh, subclinical uh, seizures. And in within seven to 14 days, we see this market astrocyte and macaglia activation. And hippocampal depth AG will show this detection of these um, uh, seizures in these animals. And we have learned this morning that interleukin and other pro-inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines might be the um, core of the problem that, that might precipitate and, and perpetuate both inflammatory state and epileptic state. So the hypothesis was that perhaps the fires and noise is a post-infectious immune system dysregulation in, healthy, in a healthy yet vulnerable individual, um, just like uh, Charlie has just mentioned. And my thought was that this interleukin cytokine system imbalance may be causing this intrinsic functional deficiency in endogenous interleukin receptor antagonist, which leads to this a spark to the blaze, an un unopposed pathologic inflammatory state driven by overactive interleukin 1 beta, as we heard, a master cytokine of local and systemic inflammation in it immunity. And so given this a compromise into leukemia one RA function in fires per patients that has been demonstrated, we propose to utilize interleukin 1RA deficient mice that exist in Charles River to mimic this salient uh, clinical feature. So the aim was to determine if interleukin 1RA deficient mice at a pro appropriate age, P15 or P25, may exhibit increased susceptibility to seizures and develop spontaneous recurrent seizures by experimentally induced fever, which is we will be doing it by injection of lipopolysaccharide combined with hyperthermia, uh, heating up uh, the ambient temperature, and then to determine if this interleukin RA deficient mice exposed to fever at P15, P25, 25 and the second hit of canate, intrahippocampal canate, two weeks later, will develop worse cell death, cognitive deficit, and prolonged seizures, uh, followed by spontaneous recurrent seizure, which is epilepsy compared to the wild type lidomate. And that was the uh, proposal. And the goal then is that we will replicate this more salient clinical features of fires and NORS in this interleukin 1 RA deficient mice to generate clinically relevant model. And what it will do is then this novel marine model fires will aid in testing and developing effective immunomodulatory therapies in the future. And one of the uh, candidate that, that I have become aware of is Enakinla interleukin 1 RA uh, does cross blood and barrier, but not fully, but there is a company working on um, uh, actually producing, synthesizing brain penetrant uh, interleukin one RA. And, and I think uh, this model once developed, we may be able to test the uh, different, the efficacy of different uh, intervention. And that is our hope. And um, again, thank you so much for your attention. And I, now I am here in University of Nebraska. Thank you, Suki. Uh, we have uh, two minutes for questions. Um, maybe I'll start with one that actually was asked earlier related to Anna Maria's talk is, is what do you think about intrathecal anakinra or won't that be necessary with this new agent? Uh, or, or should yeah, we let yeah. Olga talk about that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, um, you know, the children are so ill and uh, they do undergo a repeated lumbar puncture sometimes, both therapeutically and for diagnostic purposes. But I can tell you that I have been very excited about this new preparation 
where it is a brain penetrant. And I think we should be focused more on not, not, not only um, uh, how to give the medication, but to recognize early and to provide the immunomodulator therapy as early as possible. I think that's where we lag at this point and it's an easy target to um, focus. Okay, um, any other questions from anybody? I don't see any hands raised. Um, all right, thank you very much. We'll move on to the next data blitz which will be Olga Tarashenko. Uh, so she's an assistant professor uh, also at University of Nebraska Medical Center. She's director of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center there and the Autoimmune Seizure Laboratory. Um, she was awarded a seed grant from the American Epilepsy Society and the Norse Institute. I, really, I think she's gonna talk about that project now. She's also won a junior investigator research award from the American Epilepsy Society on the role of inflammation in autoimmune seizures. Dr. Tarashenko, take it away. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you fine, but just go into, go into slideshow. I am going to the slideshow. Okay, thank Perfect. you so much for inviting me to speak today. It's very exciting. Um, as Larry mentioned, I'm a physician scientist, so I see patients with snores and fires, and I also have a small lab, which is focused on um, mechanisms of autoimmune seizures. And um, as Larry mentioned, I received the seed grant from North Institute for which uh, we are very gra grateful. My lab was able to make some major leaps um, in the development of nanoparticles. So um, specifically, my lab is focused on anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis and uh, seizures associated with that. Um, as you know, it is a very common multifocal CNS syndrome with very prevalent seizures and frequent status epilepticus. When it comes to NORS, um, about 25% of NORS with known etiology is comprised of uh, patients with anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. And also this encephalitis contributes to about 13% of all NORS cases. And uh, from the previous literature, we know that um, antibodies that are present in encephalitis are um, pathogenic for uh, encephalopathy, but we also recently established in my lab that um, these antibodies are also directly pathogenic for seizures. It means that if you take it from the patient and infuse it to mice, they will also develop seizures. And so that's what um, we've done in the lab. We developed a mouse model of uh, seizures. We took um, CSF from patients with encephalitis um, or purified antibodies and put them in this uh, subcutaneous mini pumps. And um, the antibodies have been delivered over the course of two weeks into the lateral ventricle of mice. Um, and then we also record EEG with two subdural screws. And um, this is how the typical seizure looks like in a mouse. Um, most of the seizures are uh, non-convulsive. So this mouse kind of behaves uh, relatively normally. And you can see the development of this um, evolving spike wave discharges from uh, the subdural um, recordings. And um, on the left upper corner, you see um, the typical immunofluorescent uh, pattern, which you see in vitro with those antibodies um, exposed to the mouse tissue. So uh, with this, uh, um, in this mice, we also look at the hippocampal inflammation and we found that uh, they do develop uh, evidence of inflammation. This is um, staining for microglia and you see in the middle panel, um, you see the morphological changes in microglia, specifically changes in the uh, processes and enlargement of the cell body. Of course, these changes are not as prominent as in pilocarpine induced status epilepticus, but they're still present. And on the right uh, panel, we um, examine just the preliminary unpublished data, examine the expression of uh, mRNA for some um, specific um, uh, mediators of inflammation. And on a y-axis, you see fold change in mRNA 
in antibody treated mice as um, their reference to sham and on an x axis you see full change in the control as a reference to untreated sham and the dotted line is no change and you can see that there is a prominent increase of signal for several um, cytokines and chemokines and specifically the ones that we were interested in were um, IL-1 beta. And so I'm not going to go through this diagram. It was very elegantly shown by Anna Maria Vizani how information can either trigger or maintain the persistence of seizures and also lead to the epileptogenesis. And uh, we also know that these are um, inflammatory mediators that have been recently looked at um, uh, when it comes to NORS. And uh, we thought of um, interfering with or targeting IL-1 uh, receptor mediated signaling because we also know that from the clinical studies, um, anakinra, a recombinant IL-1 receptor antagonist, which is um, approved by the FDA for the rheumatoid arthritis, had shown a very good promise to attenuate uh, seizures in uh, patients with fires. So we then um, use the same model and um, during the continuous infusion of antibodies, we give um, anakinra systemically subcutaneously to mice over the course of five days um, here, shown here. And then uh, what we found is that um, administration of anakinra uh, significantly reduce um, the number of daily seizures as well as seizure duration, which is not shown here. Most importantly, um, Anakinra also um, reversed memory impairment in this mice um, and improved their novel object recognition as shown in this diagram here in this graph. And uh, we just um, published this data in um, epilepsy last month. And so we also look at the hippocampal information in the same animals, and we found that anakinra reduced the expression of uh, both um, astrocytic and microglial markers of inflammation in the C1 region of this mice with um, antibody-induced seizures. And so we were pretty confident that this is a good um, way to kind of pursue novel um, targets and um, choose anakinra as a potential uh, clinical, um, for the potential clinical use. However, this agent has a um, couple drawbacks. Um, the pharmacokinetic is not favorable. It's not crossing blood-brain barrier very effectively, and the timeline is relatively short, and so that uh, require multiple um, daily administrations, uh, which of course is not very convenient in patients who are admitted to the ICU. So with that, we um, uh, decided to uh, develop uh, an alternative preparation, which perhaps can be administered intranasally and bypass blood-brain barrier, and uh, also will have a longer kind of um, duration of the effect. And that was done in collaboration with um, um, our bioengineer, Dr. Lee, who is a member of our department. And uh, what uh, we've done is uh, we, we use double emulsion uh, method to develop nanoparticles. Um, uh, Anakinra was loaded on these nanoparticles. And then when we examine it under the microscope, these nanoparticles showed uniform morphology and uh, were about 200 uh, nanometers in diameter. And the next stage was to check uh, the release profile from the nanoparticles. And this is what is shown on this uh, preliminary um, uh, summary. Um, you can see that the majority of the drug in vitro is being released uh, over the course of three, four days. And um, that potentially means that um, we can uh, reduce the frequency of administrations um, clinically if we develop um, suitable com compound that will reach um, the bad side. And then for the future, we will optimize um, the release profiles. Um, we will confirm the bioactivity of the released anakinra and evaluate the stability of uh, nanakinra loaded um, nanoparticles. And then once we have a good compound, we will use it in our mouse model and we'll check the spatial distribution of nanakinra in the brain. Uh, following an intranasal administration, we'll determine the tissue concentration in the brain. And ultimately, we would like to develop an aerosolized form of nana anakinra to facilitate the delivery. So if there are any collaborators who would like to um, help us to accomplish that, please um, 
feel free to send me an email. And then uh, finally, we would like to um, use it in a seizure model to determine if intranasally administered Nana and Akindra will reduce seizures in mice. And with that, I would just like to thank my mentors here um, at UNMC and Emory, as well as my very supportive chair, Dr. Riza, uh, all my collaborators at UNMC, Mayo Clinic, Creighton, and Lankenau Institute, members of my lab, and of course, uh, the North Institute for providing this seed grant. And I will stop there. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Olga. We have uh, about one minute for questions. Uh, Alan Leviton, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, not hearing anything. Hmm. Is it in a chat box or? He raised his hand. Hmm. Um, oh, there is a question, another question um, in the chat. Should we consider treating NMDA AE with Anna Kinra? Um, <clears throat> sure, as, I, as I've mentioned, about 8% of patients will deliver refractory status epilepticus, which will fall into, um, you know, NORS, definition of NORS. And then so we could um, use it if, if um, otherwise it's clinically relevant and appropriate. So and maybe the question's getting it right, even if you don't have seizures, just for the autoimmune encephalitis itself. Uh, well, there is some ongoing work um, about uh, usefulness of anakinra for encephalopathy. So if that um, is confirmed in the future in the literature, perhaps we can use it for, for that indication. I'm not familiar for um, benefit of anakinra for new onset um, dyskinesias and uh, psychosis in NMDA encephalitis, but at least for um, cognitive impairment, uh, there is some early work in the in the literature. Great, thank you very much. We'll move on to our next and final data blitz talk. That will be from Michael Wilson, who's an associate professor of neurology at UCSF. Um, he's a specialist in uh, unexplained meningoencephalitis and trying to figure out rare infectious or autoimmune causes of those. Uh, so Dr. Wilson, take it away. Thanks so much for having me. Let me just share my screen here. Okay. Great. Um, all right, so I'll just, I think this, this we have looked at uh, fires in particular a little bit, but um, uh, with, especially with sequencing, but I, this is mostly, I want to give a super quick tour of just some of the tools we use to try and um, find uh, causes of uh, patients with idiopathic uh, meningitis and encephalitis. So the kind of first tool um, that, um, We've been pushing for a number of years now and trying to make it better and faster and, and more accessible is um, getting away from the candidate-based approach that we all as uh, physicians use to try and diagnose patients with infectious diseases. So the candidate-based approaches depend on um, having a hypothesis based on the patient's history and clinical exam and basic laboratory tests. And we come up with a, a hopefully a short list of potential infections. And then um, part, part of the reason we make the list short is because we know for each infection that we're considering, we're going to have to send off one, two, or three tests that um, look for that pathogen. And whether it's a, a direct detection test, like a PCR test that uh, looks for the particular DNA or RNA sequence of the virus or other pathogen, or an indirect test like an antibody test um, looking for uh, an immune response to a particular bug. Um, and so if you have a huge list of potential agents, then that list of individual tests you need to send quickly grows and becomes a mess. And so 
you know, this method obviously works for a lot of routine illnesses, but when it comes to patients with uh, encephalitis, uh, it, it frequently uh, fails actually about half of the time um, for a number of reasons. And so the approach that we've been pushing um, is called metagenomic next generation sequencing, which um, is a, as Dr. Haffler uh, elegantly presented earlier, um, is one of these agnostic approaches where um, we take advantage of the fact of, of what's shared across um, all infectious agents except for prions in our cells, which is that we all have a nucleic acid genome. Um, and with the you know advent of uh, cheap and fast uh, deep sequencing, we don't have to pick. We don't have to use a primer to look specifically for herpes simplex or specifically for um, tuberculosis, we can use millions of random primers to amplify up all the genetic material in the sample and then just ask a, one question, which is what do the non-human sequences that come out of the sample best match to? And so that way you can find known infections, but you can also be surprised and find an infection that's either a novel organism, that was how you know uh, the SARS-CoV-2 was first identified um, in, in Wuhan was through deep sequencing, um, or uh, you can find a pathogen that you do know about, but you just don't associate with the particular clinical syndrome that the patient has who, who you're evaluating. Um, and so we've, we've published a number of uh, case, case reports and case series with research-based metagenomic sequencing where we've identified a number of uh, sometimes treatable um, bacterial and other and viral and parasitic and um, uh, fungal infections. Um, and, uh, but then uh, have worked with our lab medicine colleagues, Charles Chu and Steve Miller to uh, validate this as a clinical assay and, and showed a couple of years ago in a multi-center study that this cl a clinically validated version of the test does enhance diagnostic yield um, in patients presenting with idiopathic uh, encephalitis and meningitis. I'll say that um, we have looked at four or five um, fires cases at least with, with deep sequencing and have come up empty. But I, I think I'm still optimistic that this uh, technique may hold some promise um, with the right types of samples and the right types of patients. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, so one, one thing that um, paper we're hoping to submit in the next couple of weeks that I think um, is promising is that you know when we do, um, do metagenomic sequencing, even in a patient who has an infection um, where the, there is microbial nucleic acid in the CSF, about 98 to 99% of the sequences we get out are actually host uh, transcripts. Um, and so um, this is a study we've been working on with uh, David Bulware and David Maya, who um, run large uh, TB and cryptococcal meningitis studies in Uganda. And, um, even in patients who are uh, almost universally infected with HIV who have low CSF cell counts, we are able to get typically about 3,000, um, uh, we transcripts to about 3,000 human uh, protein coding genes. Um, and using that, um, in this study, we were able to develop a host-based uh, gene expression signature that reliably discriminates between patients with TB meningitis and its mimics, of which there are many. Um, and I, I bring this up to say that um, we now have um, many hundreds of CSF RNA-seq profiles of patients with a variety of conditions, TB, its mimics, autoimmune encephalitis, uh, et cetera. And I think there, there's an opportunity, even if there's not a bug identified by the metagenomic sequencing assay to use the host transcriptomic data that comes along with it uh, to compare to these other diseases to see kind of what the Norris fires uh, profile best uh, fits with or, or if it has its own signature. And that could help a kind of help better classify it as, as to what type of uh, underlying etiology may we should look for, um, but also potentially to give uh, insights into uh, therapeutics that we've been hearing a lot about this morning. Um, but sometimes sequencing just isn't going to cut it. And so there are many reasons for this. Um, we know that um, with, uh, especially with neuroinvasive viruses, um, that they, like West Nile virus, they're typically only present 
in the CSF for a day or two. And so um, if you do sequencing on CSF obtained three, four weeks into someone's illness, which is what's happened with a, a number of the fires cases we've looked at, then maybe there was a viral infection initially, but it's gone. Um, you know, the patient may still be very sick, um, but if the RNA or DNA from the virus isn't present, then sequencing won't do you any good. Um, and so as a, for, as a reason for that, we, we've, um, taken a page from Steve Elge's lab at Harvard and developed a pan-viral antibody detection tool. Um, so we have, this is a phage display assay that displays about 500,000 uh, viral peptides derived from uh, the genomes of all vertebrate, tick, and mosquito viruses. And um, we try to identify um, look broadly for antibodies in the spinal fluid in patients with um, undiagnosed meningitis and encephalitis as a, as a plan B, as another indicator of, of a compartmentalized immune response to a particular virus. And I'll, I know I need to move quickly. So um, kind of the proof of principle investigation for this was another kind of mysterious pediatric inflammatory disease called acute flaccid myelitis, which has been spiking in the US every other year since 2012 of uh, children presenting with uh, a, a polio-like illness after a, a respiratory disease. And um, although uh, enteroviruses, in particular D68 and A71, were high on the list um, as potential culprits, uh, the CDC in particular was uneasy about um, kind of chalking it all up to, to those enteroviruses, namely because um, they and us and many other groups had had uh, a really, really hard time um, identifying any viral RNA in the CSF. And only about 40% of the kids had viral RNA detected anywhere in the body. And so we collaborated with a large number of groups to collect CSF from uh, over 40 kids with AFM and compare them to the CSF uh, viral antibody profiles of children with a variety of other um, inflammatory diseases and found that uh, the only uh, viral uh, family and specifically uh, the enterovirus genus um, was that was the only family and genus of, um, that discriminated between the kids with AFM and without. Um, so showing that there were high levels of enterovirus antibodies in the AFM children. And uh, interestingly, that, that held true when we broke out the children between those who had had enterovirus detected somewhere in the body and those without, suggesting that um, both cohorts of kids were, were similar. So it provided some circumstantial, additional circumstantial evidence that enterovirus was, was implicated in this disease. The last set of tools I'll just quickly go, uh, go through is um, we recognize that Sometimes these, what we presume to be infectious causes of encephalitis are not, um, whether they may be triggered by an infection or not, um, sometimes they're, they're uh, autoantibody mediated. Um, and so we, we use a variety of tools to try and identify novel antibodies, including, uh, you know, kind of conventional methods like rodent brain uh, tissue staining uh, to look for the presence of antineural antibodies in the CSF, IP mass spec using uh, rodent brain lysates to look for for, uh, antibodies targeting whole uh, neural proteins, and then another companion phage display assay um, representing all um, uh, across the whole human uh, proteome. So this was a case of a I saw of a, a man in his who's 37 had had a history of testicular cancer and presented with nine months of vertigo. Um, that had been progressive and also um, been complicated by uh, diplopia. He had to stop working and driving, um, wasn't able to pick up his children because he would uh, fall over if he tried to. And he had uh, tissue staining on a rodent brain slice, which was pretty subtle. Um, and I'll tell you more about that in a second, but it indicated that there was something uh, potentially antibody mediated going on uh, with him testing for conventional uh, known autoantibodies related to encephalitis um, were negative. Um, but with the phage display assay, we identified a, a, um, antibodies to a protein for which there isn't a neuroscience literature called Couch-like protein 11. Um, and that was confirmed by 
multiple methods. And in this case, you know, for about a year, this was just a single case. Um, but then uh, working with uh, colleagues at Mayo, it turned out that this uh, staining pattern uh, was something that they had a name for, it's called sparkles. Um, and it had been seen um, in, in men with ataxia that in a history of testicular cancer that they'd been collecting over a 20 year period. Um, and uh, when, when we talked to them about this autoantigen, it turned out that all those cases also had antibodies to calculate protein 11. This was uh, work with Sean Pittock and Dib Dubay. And so uh, we believe this is the second um, autoantibody associated with um, testicular cancer um, in addition to MA2. Um, so that's, that's an example of kind of how these tools can help, help explain another piece of, of these uh, neuroinflammatory diseases. So just thinking about NORS, as I've said, I think, you know, sequencing is thus far in a very small number of samples not identified a pathogen. I think, and that may just, there may not be something to find there, but I think um, what I would love to, to look at would be, you know, well curated, meaning uh, quickly frozen, hyperacute CSF and blood samples um, that uh, that may still harbor, you know, uh, nucleic acid from from a virus or other uh, infection that that may have disappeared uh, later in the illness. I think even if there's not a pathogen identified, you will get lots of good uh, bulk uh, RNA-seq data uh, in the CSF and blood, um, and that can be compared to the you know, beautiful uh, single cell data that Dr. Hafler talked about. Um, in addition, um, there's, there's an opportunity with these pan viral antibody detection tools to um, both look acutely in CSF, but even in acute and convalescent sera to look for seroconversion to a, to a virus that may have triggered an illness. Um, and then lastly, um, there's a number of autoantibody discovery tools that we and others uh, employ to um, try and identify uh, antibody mediated uh, mechanisms of disease. So I blazed through a ton of uh, collaborative work. There are many people to thank and I'm happy to, to answer questions and also wanna thank the patients that uh, participate in these studies. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Uh, so we're, well behind, as people know, I think we'll do about a 10 minute general question and discussion from the entire meeting and Dr. Gaspard is gonna moderate that. Uh, you're muted, Nicholas. You can't unmute. <laughs> no, I can. There no, you I go. Can. Thanks, Larry. Um, well, thank you very much to all the data speakers. It was, um, an amazing feat to uh, convey so much information in, in so short an amount of time. Uh, we have plenty of questions actually from, from, from the audience. Um, I start with one, I think to, to Dr. Uh, Dr. Wilson, um, where is the genetic material in the CSF, where, where does the genetic material in the CSF come, come from? Uh, why blood cells, microsomes, and other source? It's a good question. We we when we when we do the bulk sequencing, we take um, some supernatant and the and the invisible pellet. Um, so I don't I don't you know I can't rigorously answer that question. We kind of look at both um, you know act, any just free floating DNA or RNA, but also um, uh, you know nucleic acid that we can get from from intact cells. So I'm not sure, I, I can say what was pl a pleasant surprise to me with this uh, TB meningitis study I quickly mentioned, you know, those are HIV infected patients. And so many have, even though they have um, an opportunistic infection, many have very bland CSF and we were still able to recover, meaning, you know, very few cells. Um, and we still were able to recover um, really nice uh, host, host data. So it can't be entirely dependent on uh, cell count, which, which makes me excited for, you know, a condition like Norse and fires where, where my understanding is, you know, the cell counts are typically not normal, but they're also not always sky high. Right, yeah, this was a, um, I'm gonna, it's a quick follow question that I, I had for you. Um, uh, um, you yes, the, usually the CSF, uh, profile and, and, and actually imaging is not in favor of direct infection in, in, in NORS. Doesn't look like encephalitis. 
Um, but at the same time, we do believe there is an infectious connection, uh, but it's probably an overreaction of the immune system to, to some extra CNS infection. How does metagenomics apply to, to, to non-CSF sample? Can, can you do it on nasal swab? Can you do it on stools? Can you do it on... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we you know, I'm very biased towards CSF and, and sometimes brain tissue, but um, but yeah, we when when it's clinically relevant, we absolutely look at look at other tissues. So um, yeah, we can, you can do it on any tissue there. Um, and we do do, you know, there's a, a clinic, UCSF and, and a private company, Carius are now doing metagenomic sequencing on plasma. The problem I think with, with that is um, for the purposes of this uh, syndrome is that um, the clinical plasma testing is just looking at cell-free DNA. And I, I, I would want to, you know, for a condition like this, I wouldn't want to exclude the possibility of an RNA virus. So, um, so we would want to do, you know, more research-based sequencing, doing both RNA and DNA. All right. Thank you. Um, so, we, we, um, for, for the audience, uh, if anyone wants to <coughs> ask a question, please raise your hand, and we'll, we'll open the mic for you, uh, or, or just send uh, a question in, in the chat. We. Um, We've had question uh, submitted before the meeting. I'm going to go through some of them. Um, at, at the same time, is, if there is anyone among the speakers who want you to comment on, on things, other things that, that have been said um, on others' IDs, please please feel free to uh, to, to, to do so. Um, there was a question submitted before the the, the meeting, which I, I guess is geared to the. Um, to the Anakinra and IL one receptor grooves among the, among the, among the speakers, uh, does anyone did anyone uh, has anyone looked at at blockage of blockade of, of IL one pathway uh, signaling pathway beyond the receptor? Uh, so I guess it's it, the question is is beyond Anakinra and 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 other uh, is there any other drug available commercially or not that it can be used to target the IL one pathway? And has, has it been tried? And, and, and mm. so, does it work? I don't know. Mm. Olga, yeah. maybe. I can. Uh, I oh, can add a comment. Yeah. Yes, I can add a comment. Well, uh, there are certainly more drugs that target the IL1 beta system. Uh, for example, canakinumab, that is uh, a monoclonal antibody against uh, interleukin one beta, that has been. Uh, uh, that is in clinical use has been tested also in other conditions uh, and um, and there is a, a clinical study where anakira was combined with kanakinubab uh, i don't remember if it was a fires or if it was a uh, an epilepsy, drug resistant epilepsy in the context of an auto inflammatory condition, but there is a case report showing that the combination of the two uh, was working better than either one alone. Uh, then there are inhibitors of the inflammasome that are used for auto inflammatory conditions that uh, are certainly very interesting drugs in the experimental uh, context. They have not been used as drugs, but interventions against uh, uh, messenger RNA for, for uh, inflammasomes uh, type 1 and 3 have been attempted with silencing RNA interventions uh, and with therapeutic effects in animal models. So the inflammasome is certainly an interesting target to consider, and there are drugs already in the, in the clinical uh, realm that could be uh, investigated. Another point I would like to raise is that the uh, neuroinflammatory response, uh, as I mentioned, is very, very strictly associated with evidence for oxidative stress. And oxidative stress also contributes to seizure mechanism in animal models. So uh, I, would, I would like to raise the point of also considering this uh, process as a potential target because there are drugs uh, antioxidant drugs that could be uh, considered uh, as add-on therapy and, uh, and in the animal models they provided very interesting therapeutic effects. Maybe Olga has something to add uh, to, to this. I, I think you, you covered it very well, Anna Maria. So there's a um, number of experimental agents that are working on IL-1 receptor still. I don't think they were 
tried in in patients, but there are a couple in the pipeline. And as you mentioned, inflammasome is kind of a big target. And, and then finally, you know, ketogenic diet and, and the pathway that is linked to, to that um, and, and IL-1 pathway, how they overlap and inter, you know, interwork. Thanks. Speaking of um, oxidative stress and, and um, there is a, a uh, there are a couple of questions regarding um, amino acid supplements, the role of mitochondria uh, in, in, in the pathways to, to, to NORS. Um, any, any insight on how the immune system might affect mitochondrial function and, and, or, or the other way around? Yes, there is a strict association between these two pathogen potential pathogenic pathways, inflammation and oxidative stress at various levels because uh, inflammatory molecules uh, can uh, trigger the transcriptional induction of uh, uh, nitric oxide synthase and other uh, genes that can contribute to oxidative stress. And, uh, and in, in epilepsy model other than fires, <laughs> it has been shown that there is a mitochondrial dysfunction contributing to oxidative stress, but also activation of not the pH oxidase, that is a cytoplasmatic membrane-bound enzyme that produces uh, reactive oxygen species, uh, and it is very much involved in the production of uh, reactive uh, species uh, contributing to seizure mechanism. And, um, and, uh, and, and there are molecular pathways connecting the two that are very interacting with each other. So, um, therefore, I think th th there is a, a basic uh, a knowledge about uh, that that could be also, uh, mm, you know, um, used to, 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 to determine uh, novel targets because the two systems really interact a lot. And I don't think there is much known about oxidative stress in fires, nor so maybe should be also investigated. There are markers that can, measure, can be measured in the blood, for example. Okay, we have five minutes left. Uh, we're gonna try to squeeze um, maybe three questions and comments in, in, in this in amount of time. We have one live question from, from the audience from Dr. Fang. Dr. Fang, you're unmuted, please go ahead. Uh, I'm Jim Pong. I, actually, my famous connection is that I am Nora's cousin, first cousin. And so, so in fact, I, you know, when Nora first asked, you know, is this something that would be worth doing? I said, it's great. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm amazed that she's done so well uh, and really started a whole institute. But I want to ask, as, as many as there are eminent immunologists in this group, has people thought about metabolic changes post receptor um, that could could be the target of something that has either been, been done by the virus or some uh, or some um, rare um, genetic disorder. It's, it's interesting that you know that uh, Michael talked about viruses because of the viruses, especially especially those that are carcinogenic like capacities, basically they they basically take and hijack, the T cell um, enzymes like biosynthetic enzymes and particularly proline biosynthetic enzymes and use them in fact to turn uh, the, the cell into, into, into a, um, a carcin oncogenic process. And also that has been uh, recently also mentioned with, with SARS-CoV-2. And I just wondered whether or not any of the group has, has sort of thought about or, or asked questions about post-receptor events that could cause uh, uh, ROS besides proline dehydrogenase is markedly uh, uh, increased by P53 for cancer and actually causes ROS, a great increase in ROS. And that can either be, be, uh, uh, be um, carcinogenic or it can be ap apoptotic. So it all, that depends on the, on the um, you know, on the specific uh, metabolic context. So I just wondered if, if any one of you have thought of any post-receptor, uh, post-cytokine kind of effects. Anyone among the um, speakers? 
I, I guess I, I'm no uh, expert in metabolic pathways, but I, you know, one thing I would throw out there is that um, to the, you know, it's a, it's a really, really interesting idea, especially um, thinking about a virally mediated um, uh, condition. And you know, there's for viruses that are polyadenylated, that have polyadenylated transcripts, um, you know, those might actually be picked up and people have done studies with this with the 10x genomics platform. So um, that could be, you know, in addition to bulk metagenomic sequencing, there's an opportunity with the 10x data that uh, being generated to look at within individual cells, you know, non-human transcripts uh, that might have been captured by the 10X probes, um, just to, to get at that question of, is there evidence for an intracellular um, viral infection in any of the cell types? I, I, would just effort, that, yeah. Yeah, I would just say that when, of course, when you look at T cells in different tissues, and I alluded to this, um, they take on the metabolic characteristics of the tissue they're in. So as we, we found a high number of cholesterol receptors, for example, on T cells in the nervous system that we didn't see outside. And, and they're utilizing cholesterol as metabolically. So even forgetting even just viruses, just the tissue itself will drive the metabolic nature uh, of, of the cells and, and change their functionality based on that. We also looked at fat tissue and showed that a lake acid was critical for, for driving the homostatic state of T cells in, in normal adipose tissue and this altered in MS patients. Mm. All right, thank you very much. I, I'm afraid time's running out. Uh, there's just one small minute left and I hand over the, the microphone to, to, to Larry. It's been a very fruitful discussion. Don't forget about the family conference that starts uh, later on um, today. Let me check the time at 1.30 uh, uh, p.m. and you all got the, the link to directly access the Zoom meeting uh, in, in, in the email you received while registering for the, uh, for the family conference. Larry, the mic is yours. Okay, I just wanted to thank everybody, uh, particularly all the speakers for a fantastic meeting. We do have it recorded. Um, so if others want it or you want to rehear anything, uh, let us know and we'll give you access to that. Um, and with that, I hope to see some of you at the family conference. And for the rest, thanks for joining. Thank you very much.